A wonderful evening to all of you. And uh, can you say to the person beside you, God has called you to be an influence in changing history for his kingdom. Amen. As men, we are called by God to make a difference in our generation. God always begins his work with a man, and we see also that in history. We saw that also in the history of Israel. From the story of creation down to the coming of Jesus Christ on earth, God is always beginning his work in the world by calling a man. He's always a man, okay? And uh, tonight we're going to focus on the topic, the measure of a real man. What are we here for? As a man of integrity, this is a fellowship where men help men become better men. Can we say that together? Where men help men become better men. We do not claim that anyone among us is uh, greater than others, okay? We're all the same, we're all growing. Even as I'm sharing with you things that I've learned in my life, I'm also in the process of growing myself and I make myself accountable to other men, as particularly to the men of our church, our leaders, and also to the core, uh, soon to, move, to be formed, the core of our MI2. We believe that we need each other because it takes a man to help build a man. Okay? Same thing kung may anak po kayong, if you have a son in your family, you know it takes a, a man to build a man. Don't entrust your son to your wife. Okay? When that's a boy, that's your full responsibility. Okay? So this is a place where we help each other become better men. So we're not perfect, but we can become better and better by the grace of God. That's why we are here. Okay? And we are, our theme uh, quote for this uh, ministry is the one given by Ed Cole. Can we read that together? Becoming male is a matter of birth. Becoming a man is a matter of choice, okay? Our theme verse is Micah 6, 8. Can we read it together? He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This verse summarizes the three core values of Men of Integrity International. Here we desire to see men developing integrity in their lives, developing compassion for others, and developing a deep and strong spirituality, a relationship with God, which is the foundation of both our capacity for integrity and our compassion for other people, okay? Our purpose here is mentoring men for effective godly leadership and influence in the home, the church, workplace, community, and the nation. Wherever God has positioned you as a man, God has strategically positioned you there for a reason. You are God's agent of change wherever you are, okay? And God has given you the gifts, the connections, the experience that you need, and that you will be equipped with more as you serve the Lord in that capacity in making it your goal to be an influence for the kingdom of God, for the an influence for Christ in your work, place of work or ministry. The goal of this uh, fellowship or this movement is to help build men characterized by spirituality, integrity, and compassion. Can we read it together? Help build men characterized by spirituality, integrity, and compassion based on Micah 6, eight. You know, as men, and I've often been emphasizing this, the reason why we are so strategic in God's plan for the world is because as men, God never looks at you individually. God looks at you generationally. Can we say that together? As a man, we are generational. Because what I am today influences generations to come. No nation can be greater than the kind of man it produces. Why? Because each man is a generational being and his character influences the character of future generations. This has been taught many times in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, where God says that when you obey, this generation obeys him, it will influence generations to come in obeying God. When one generation turns away from God, that generation will influence the next generation to turn away from God. And that's why what, however we live today will definitely affect the next generation, okay? Dietrich Bonhoeffer is very one of his uh, most often quoted uh, uh, you know, truth said that the righteous man lives for the next generation. The righteous man lives for the next generation. You know, when you pursue integrity and righteousness as a man, you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the next generation. 
Okay? I remember the uh, words of uh, Taksin Shinawatra, former Prime Minister of Thailand. He said, you know, the politician always looks to the next election. The statesman looks to the next generation. If we focus on the next generation, we can do a lot of change. You agree with uh, Shinawatra? You see? Politicians only look to the next election. But a statesman, somebody who really uh, fulfills his calling, you know, to serve the people sacrificially, that's a statesman. A statesman always looks to the next generation. And if you focus on the next generation, we can do a lot of change. I also remember uh, what um, one of the multinational uh, business uh, consultants in Makati said, uh, the Wallace Business, business Forum. How many of you heard of the Wallace Business Forum in Makati? Okay. Um, Mr. Wallace is very well respected by many multinational businessmen as a, as a man of wisdom. And when he was interviewed by the media uh, around uh, you know, their late 1990s, he was being asked about the prospects of the future of the Philippines given our present political, economic, and social conditions. And uh, he was asked, do you think the, the Philippines has a future? And he said, well, it's too late for this generation but can't we start with the next one? We must, we must develop a socially responsible young generation if we're going to have a lot of hope. And he said, it's not that, it's not that the job of the Christian church. Okay? We need to mold a socially responsible next generation if we want to have hope for the future. And isn't that the job of the Christian church? I only agree with his first statement, 50%. When he said, it's too late for our generation. Matitigas na kasi mga buto eh, no? <laughs> it's hard to break old habits, you know, from our generation. That's why he said, it's too late for our generation. We already have the bad habits. It's hard to break. But I, I believe, as the Bible teaches, that you can never successfully mold a strong and righteous next generation if they cannot find models in our generation. Young people are always looking for role models that will follow. If they cannot find that role model in their family, they'll, found, they'll find it in the media, they'll find it in the movie industry, they'll find it in the internet. And whoever they see as a role model that gives them a sense of identity, that's the person they would like to emulate and imitate. Young people need role models, and we need to be those role models. We need to be radical enough to recognize that unless we provide a model for this next generation, the next generation will simply repeat the mistakes of our generation. Okay? In the late 1880s, Benjamin B. Warfield, a professor at Princeton University, traced the known descendants of Jonathan Edwards. Who of you are familiar with Jonathan Edwards? Okay, Jonathan Edwards was the first president of Princeton University and one of the key preachers in the religious revival known as the Great Awakening in America during the 18th century. Okay, in fact, the, that major revival that took place in America started in his own church. It, that revival lasted to almost a century. I want, I want to hear that. That revival lasted for almost a century. And Benjamin Warfield wanted to uh, find how the influence of one father can affect generations to come. And so in order to, uh, you know, fulfill his thesis, he chose Jonathan Edwards, a role model, and tried to trace all his known descendants and find out what happened to his descendants. Richard Dugdale, a sociologist and contemporary of Warfield, also traced the known descendants of Max Jukes. How many of you have heard of this before? This, this research? Okay, only a few. Richard Dugdale was inspired by Warfield's research and wanted to do his own research, but his, he decided to focus on an opposite subject, the opposite, which meant somebody who's not godly, somebody who's not righteous. And his subject was Max Jukes, a man named Max Jukes. Jukes was a Dutch immigrant that arrived in New York in the early 1700s. He was an atheist, an alcoholic who could not hold a job, and he married a prostitute. I mean, think of the worst case scenario, okay? So he wanted to know what was the impact of this man on his future generations. Are you interested to know the results of this research? Okay. Let's take a look first at Max Jukes. Okay. Richard Dugdale was able to trace 903 descendants of Max Jukes. And out of these 903 descendants, he discovered that 310, imagine, that's almost one third, 
became delinquents who never finished school and died in poverty. 145 became confirmed drunkards and live, you know, a, a, a life of failure in their families. 190 became public prostitutes. The mother, remember, was a, the wife was a prostitute, okay? 285, but sexually transmitted diseases. 150 spent an average of 13 years in prison, including seven convicted murderers. Can one man affect future generations? The influence of the, the character of the father, the influence of the character of the wife affected generations to come. You know, if you think about the history of America, do you think this, this man, these descendants contributed to the greatness of America? Absolutely not. But let's take a look at the results of the research on Jonathan Edwards by, Richard, uh, by uh, um, Benjamin Warfield. Benjamin Warfield was able to trace 1,394 descendants, okay? And this was the result. 13 became college presidents, 65 college professors, 30 judges, 100 lawyers, 60 physicians, okay, we'll go on to the next slide. 75 army and navy officers, 100 pastors, 60 prominent authors, three United States senators, 80 public servants in other capacities, including governors and ministers to foreign countries, and one vice president of the United States of America. His name was Aaron Burr, okay? Did the life of one man affect the future of America? These are the men who contributed to the greatness of the United States of America. And they were the product of only one man who decided to walk with God. A man who decided to pursue righteousness. He was the key preacher that God used to, to you know, in the great awakening of America. So many turned back to God. So many repented of their sins and pursued a life of righteousness through the influence of his ministry. Uh, many of you may have, some of uh, pastors among you may have read his message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That's one of his most <laughs> uh, famous of his messages, okay, Jonathan Edwards. And you can see people just falling to the ground in his, whenever he preaches, you know, repenting of their sins. And during the Great Awakening, imagine the bar started to close up and later on was were taken over by the churches. The bars converted into churches. Many prostitutes came to Jesus Christ and they have to shut down many prostitute uh, you know, uh, centers because prostitutes were turning to Christ, okay? Why? Because there was such a hunger for holiness and righteousness because one man dared to be righteous. And he set a model for his generation, okay? Do you understand that? I'm going to ask you this question. What do you think about your future generations? What will they be like? If you want to know what your future generations will be like, let's take a look at the mirror and look at ourselves because the answer is there in the mirror. What I am today is going to affect my children and my children's children. You know, our, our nation, our culture has been damaged so much because of generational transmission of wrong ways of bringing up children. Children are more cursed in our families than they are affirmed and blessed, okay? And this is a habit that's been transmitted from generation to generation. That's why before we begin to think about, you know, what I'm going to do, if there's something wrong that we are tempted to do, we need to ask yourself, do I want my children to do the same thing? Do I want my generations to come to continue what I'm starting to do right now? Because once I start this, and if I don't turn away from this, I will never know when this will stop through my generations. Whenever adultery takes place in one generation, you'll find out, study carefully those who have committed adultery. In the next generation, there will always be adultery, and the next generation, and the next generation. I've been a counselor for more than 30 years with my wife, and the majority of my counseling cases are adulteries, infidelities, okay? And I tell you, I always ask, was there adultery in your parents' uh, relationship? Almost 99%, they will say yes. You understand this, okay? Becoming male is a matter of birth. You cannot decide what your gender will be when you were born. But to become a man is not automatic. It's a matter of choice. You need to build in yourself the qualities that make you the real man that God wants you to be so that your life will truly make a difference for your generation. He said the reason why families fail and societies fall is because there are more boys out there than there are real men. 
you know, in our Filipino culture, I don't know if you notice it, when was the time that you know you became a man? The women in our culture know when. When, do they, when does a girl turn into a woman? Okay, one is when she starts to menstruate. But there is a public ceremony that we have that, you know, there is a rite of passage where a girl is recognized now to be a woman. That's the debu, right? Tayo mga lalaki, walang ganun. So do we have a particular ceremony where we know we have transitioned from boyhood to manhood? Wala. Tuli, hindi. Marami sa atin, tunuli. Baby pa lang tayo. Hindi naman tayo naging totoong lalaki nun. <laughs> Di ba? We were circumcised, we were still uh, an infant. So that doesn't make us a man. Some say, or the barkada. But in most experiences of men, the barkada all the more perpetuates the boy in the body of the man. Kasi we are, we are taught to conform always to the to the expectations of the barkada. We cannot stand on our own. We cannot have our own belief and conviction. We have to makisama sa barkada. So it doesn't help us become real men, right? So is there any real transition ceremony in our culture when we know that that day I became a man? Because I choose to build those qualities, those requirements that will make society recognize I am now a man. In many cultures, particularly in Africa, a boy at, at an age of 12 or 13 will be trained by his father for one year before that on how to hunt. And when he, each, each, he reaches age 13, that's when he transitions to become a man, he will have to go out there into the field alone. It has to bring, we have to bring back you know, a particular animal that is specified by the tribe, and if you can bring that animal back and you're still alive, all the society, the tribe will recognize he has become a man. And he knows from that day onward, he stepped out of boyhood and became a man. And that's why he's very conscious about his responsibilities as a man. He knows the expectation of the society from him as a man because he has decided to be a man. Question, in our Philippine culture, do we have anything like that? Right, that's a problem. Okay? That's why we need to come to a point in our history and men of integrity as a movement is, is really desiring to help men transition from boyhood to manhood by learning to develop those qualities that make us real men from God's point of view. The one who created us, the one who designed us knows what it means to be the kind of man that we were meant to be. And that is what we have been discussing here in our dinners, okay? So can you say to the person beside you, praise the Lord. I can be a man. <laughs> okay? What is the measure of a real man? In our last uh, dinner, we talked about what was God's purpose for the man when he created him, right? When God created Adam, he was created alone. God created a woman only sometime after that. After God created a man, the first thing that God did was put him in his personal garden, his private garden in Eden, in order to help him experience a unique and special relationship with God. The very first thing that God gave man after he was created was for him to walk in intimacy with the Creator. That's what you call spirituality. Okay? The foundation of manhood is your relationship with God. No man can be greater than his walk with God. Can we say that together? No man can be greater than his walk with God. If you do not have a relationship with God, a real relationship with God, you'll find it so very difficult to overcome the many challenges and temptations that often keep us boys, and sometimes we can become boys for life. We never mature. You know why? Because it takes a real man to keep a marriage for life. Let me repeat that. It takes a real man to keep a marriage for life. Ed Cole said the reason why many marriages are failing is because they're just boys. They don't understand responsibility. They don't understand commitment. They don't understand discipline. They don't understand, you know, what it means to love a family. 
We are very more concerned about ourselves more than our wife and our children. When our happiness is more important than the happiness of our wife and our children, we're not yet men. From God's point of view, you're still boys. It's so always thinking about ourselves. Do you understand this? That's why it takes a real man to keep a marriage for life. We need to know what it means to be a man. And so God gave his word to the man. The first test of the man was a command given by God. God said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you are not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. God is saying, your first test is this. You must keep the word that I gave you. You must demonstrate integrity in your relationship with me. You must learn obedience even when it's hard. Understand that the first test is about his obedience to God's word. And that is what builds righteousness. Obedi righteousness is simply loyalty and obedience to God's rules. Okay? And so, but Adam failed, right? And who was the first one to disobey? It was the woman, right? Okay? Where was Adam when Eve was, you know, partaking of the forbidden tree? For forbidden fruit? The Bible said that Adam was just beside her. Adam did not even try to stop the woman. He could see what was happening, but he was not doing anything about it. Listen to this. Many men fail in their families because they fail to take spiritual leadership in their families. The fall of man is the result of the failure of leadership. Adam should have exercised leadership and stopped his wife from eating the forbidden tree, from forbidden fruit because he, he knows the command of God and he has told the woman the command of God. But he was just a passive observer. Men, for, especially for those who are fathers, you cannot be passive as you see your children doing wrong things. Understand that? You cannot leave that to your wife. The, the impact of a father on the molding of the children's behavior is more powerful than the influence of a mother. That was God commanded the fathers to be the one to mentor their children. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, God's word says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger because of abuse, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The command to bring up children is not given to the wife, it's given to the man. As the head of the home, you are the primary mentor and shaper of the lives of your children, not your wife. Your wife is only the assistant. But God expects the man to be the one to take leadership in teaching his children how to live right. That is God's expectation of us, okay? That's why if you're not spending time with our children, one day you may regret that lack of involvement when our children begin to go into directions that may even bring scandal or shame to our reputation as fathers because we failed to give time to them. I have so many stories to tell in my counseling experience. You know, sometimes um, people who are leaders in their churches, especially those who are really busy in the work in the church, often oftentimes are the ones who are negligent of the, in the mentoring responsibility of their children. They leave their children to the Sunday school. I remember the time when I was a pastor of a church in Manila, in BF Homes. We were just starting our Sunday school ministry and one of the parents, the fathers came to me, you know, pastor, I'm not, I'm not happy with our Sunday school. And I said, why? You know, my, my children are not learning much. I mean, I mean who's going to teach them, you know? They have to know the word of God, but they do not know much. I've been asking them, what did you learn? And not much, just playing games, you know, things like that. Pastor, we better do something about the Sunday school. The Sunday school must teach the children the word of God. Okay, and I said, brother, isn't that your primary responsibility as a father? That church can never take the place of a father in his family. The church is only a support. The church is only a partner, but it can never take the place of the parents in the molding of the values and the habits and the convictions and the character of their children. And they ask him, what are you doing? You know, pastor, I'm very busy. I'm working hard, you know, all those usual excuses of men. That's why I don't have time. That's why I really want the Sunday school to teach my children. 
What if you don't have a Sunday school? What will happen to your children? You understand that? You, you got what I'm trying to tell him? That is your responsibility, first of all, not the responsibility of the church. Okay? And that's why we need to recognize that as men, we must take leadership. Not all leaders are men, but all men were designed to lead. Okay? Can you say to the person beside you, you're a leader, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Let me show you how God sees the role of man in society. Here in Ezekiel 22 30, 30, God explains to the prophet Ezekiel why God ultimately destroyed Israel, particularly Jerusalem. And this is the story why. He said, I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it. But I found no one. Okay? What is he saying? You see, the picture is that God is picturing himself as an enemy of Israel because Israel has been unfaithful to God. Israel has been regularly rebelling against God. And based on God's law, God will have to judge them. And God is picturing himself like a foreign invader who is about to judge and punish his nation Israel. And as he looks at that, as he looks at the injustices and the wickedness of the people, he's already ready to bring judgment and punishment, but he's still waiting for just one man who can give him a reason not to punish that nation. He's just looking for one man. I look for a man. The word here in Hebrew is ish. Ish is the common word for man in distinction from woman. It's also the same word for husband in the Old Testament. I'm looking for a man who will build the wall. What is the wall? The picture is like this. In ancient times, all the cities were surrounded by walls. A, a city is defined by its walls. Any village that has no walls is not a city. It's just a village. The moment of a big village or a big settlement is surrounded by walls that is now defined as a city, okay? Now the walls usually have, you know, a, uh, you call that a uh, dugout trench in front of it, right? So that they, they put, fill that with water. And then there's a place where people can enter into the city by one gate, okay? And usually they put tar there and, and they can put fire there. When the enemy attacks, they will set that on fire. Okay, so the picture is here. God is about to invade and destroy his own people and is looking for somebody to build the wall and stand in the gap between the wall and the enemy that is in the breach in order to stop God from attacking the land. And he said, I'm looking for a man who will build the wall. What is that wall that God is looking for? In the, in the prophets, that wall refers to righteousness. What keeps God from judging a nation is when he sees righteousness in the nation. You should remember the negotiation between Abraham and God when God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Lot, his nephew, and his family were living in Sodom. And so Abraham was, you know, uh, rather apprehensive that his nephew and his family will be, you know, altogether destroyed along with the Sodomites when God began to pour out your know, fire and brimstone from heaven to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he pleaded with God, God, if there are 50 righteous men in the land, would you still destroy it? Would you not spare it for the sake of the 50 righteous? He said, for the sake of the 50 righteous, I will not destroy it. So he went on negotiating from 50 to 40 to 30 to 20. And finally, he stopped at 10. The problem is that Lot's family was only six. <laughs> Does him and his wife and his two daughters, and his two daughters had a boyfriend, okay? And so there were around six. So he stopped at 10. God said, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy the land. The problem was the family of Lot was less than 10. What was going to keep God from destroying Sodom and Gomorrah if there was enough righteous people in it? To give me the assurance that through the influence of their righteousness, they can still help the people turn back to God. You see, the presence of the righteous in the land brings hope to the nation. Even if there's just a few righteous people, but a few righteous people who are committed to influence their generation towards righteousness, that gives God a reason to withhold judgment and not continue on with his plan. Because the righteous becomes the hope. 
against the divine judgment. Do you understand this? Wherever you are in your company, in your school, wherever you are right now, you're pursuing righteousness in your life makes you a channel of blessing in that particular world where you are being planted by God. Remember Joseph? Joseph was in Egypt. He was the only righteous man there, right? But because of Joseph's loyalty to God, even though the Pharaoh worshiped other gods, God blessed Egypt because of him by becoming the advisor to the Pharaoh and saved Pharaoh from seven years of famine. You understand that? He became a channel of blessing because of his righteousness. God made him a channel of hope to the nation of Egypt, even though it's a very pagan nation. You understand this? Wherever you are, if you maintain your righteousness, God will use you to influence others back to God. That's why Jesus said, let your light shine among men that they will see your good works and because of that, they will be drawn to your Father. They will bring praise to your Father in heaven because they will say to you, you know, Akal, I never knew that there are still people like you, you know, on earth. You're really one of a kind and I really admire you. That is what Jesus said. They will bring praise to your Father because they see that you are different because you walk in godliness. You refuse to compromise. That is the kind of influence that brings hope to the people against divine judgment.